what's the future of materials? What's the future of objects? What's the future of products? Um, we have learned yesterday that we need to live with less but better products. Uh, we need to create a smaller carbon footprint. That's crystal clear. Can, what role can materials play in that regard? So we have uh, conceived a panel with some very interesting names coming from different perspectives. Uh, we have Natsai Audrey Chiesa. She is the founder and director of Faber Futures. We have Eric Klarenbeek from Klarenbeek and Ross, founder. We have Helene Steiner, director of Open Cell. And the discussion will be chaired by Nancy Denise. And she is the uh, leader of the CSM um, Masters Biodesign course at Central St. Martin's Academy, Design Academy. So please welcome to the stage Natsai, Eric, Helene, and Nancy. Have fun. The stage is yours. Right. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We are very excited to be here. And uh, we, as you know, there is a very interesting format to these talks where people have to select two images, which is very interesting because there is this need of synthesis. So we are going to start with the format is two images. One represents the status quo, and the second image re represents the future, the um, solution. So we are going to start with Natze, and this is her first image, and I'm just going to ask her to start. Thank you, Nancy. Um, it's really great to be here, and I'm really excited to have this discussion um, and encompass, encompassed by so many different fields. Um, my uh, practice uh, started a very long time ago as um, somebody from an architectural background going into material futures. Um, I was really fascinated by the potential for emerging technologies um, in biology to start to shape our sort of material environments. Um, and maybe 10 years after starting the research um, that this organism kind of catalyzed, um, I founded a company called Faber Futures, um, and really we're a design agency at the intersection of technology, nature, and society. And what we're asking is, how do we have a holistic approach to uh, developing these technologies to sort of enable a preferable future um, with um, biotechnology, for example? Um, and um, I think I will very quickly go into the image. Um, it's it's, a, it's a, an organism called Streptomyces silicolor. Um, it produces lots of different compounds in science. It is a status quo organism because scientists have been researching it for many, many years um, because it produces antibiotics uh, and lots of other uh, molecules. Uh, if you are familiar with the smell of rain, actually it's streptomyces in the soil that produce geosmin, uh, another compound, and that's what we kind of associate with the smell of rain. But it also produces this pigment, a uh, pigment molecule called actinohodin. And this is what sort of captivated my imagination um, as, a, as a material futures um, designer, uh, because the question was, okay, this organism naturally produces this pigment. Um, how can I work with it, if at all, um, as a designer without a science background um, to, to do something novel? Um, and, and so I've used this image as my status quo because I was thinking in status quo modes when I first started the research. Um, and my concern was how do I separate the organism from the pigments so that I can do beautiful silkscreen printing. And for about a year, that didn't work. Um, I, I, I spent a lot of time trying to refine those processes and, and struggled, essentially. Um, and so that was my status quo, but it's also the industry of um, bio, the biotechnologies industry's sta status quo, where um, innovators today are looking at different organisms and different biological systems and saying, how do we make this particular organism create this particular compound 
Um, and then investors say, uh, we will only invest in this if it can compete with the price of the pet petroleum derivative. And so this is shaping the market of um, fabrication with uh, living systems. And I think this is uh, problematic because if we take this approach, this cultural um, approach of only seeing this as a commodity compound, um, then it's not going to develop in the way in which um, it could. And so the next image is... Um, oh. It, I, I assumed my, my non-status quo mm. image was the next one, my alternative. Mm. But perhaps we are go we're cycling through <laughs> everyone's <laughs> status quo image. Uh, I think we have to present the status quo for okay, all great. of us. And then, it, so you're next. And then he gives the solution. Okay. I thought it was in order. Yeah. So Eric Thanks, presents the status quo. Hello, welcome. Um, I'm Eric from Clara Make and Dross. So we are a design studio, and I'm super happy to be here in the city where I was born. So thanks a lot. Um, this is a project we initiated a couple of years ago in, uh, in Arles, the south of France, the, the city where Van Gogh uh, cut off his ear. And uh, there we had the opportunity to set up a, a bio lab, an LG lab, at uh, Luma, Luma Foundation, which is there. And with the presence of microalgae, we were able to convert these microalgae in a wetland, which is comparable to the Netherlands, but then there are flamingos instead of pigeons, <laughs> what we have here. And um, we converted these algae from the wetlands into biopolymers. And these are the prototypes. So it shows the proof of, proof of concept, um, but it's not reality yet. And I was just brainstorming with uh, Marcel Wanders from how to implement these kind of biopolymers, how can we make this, yeah. this real, you know? Um, and one of these practical problems we faced uh, with this material is that we can 3D print a cup, we can 3D print a cutoff, we can make it out of the local resources, and that was exactly our idea, to use these small factories, such as 3D printers, which can be placed all around our planet, that they could produce our daily needs um, <laughs> on the spot. And that's what we still are working on, and um, so it shows an ID, um, which we still have to implement, and then it comes down to simple things, such as food safety. So we don't have the food certification yet, so we're not able to even drink from our cups, although we did it daily, <laughs> and our whole family, our kids, everybody still alive. did it. But it's not legal. So, and that was also for 3D printing. So there are very these kind of things which we have to overcome, um, by using new technologies, even 3D printing, which is like 50 years old, um, that we are able to use that on a food safe and material level. Very good. Yeah. So maybe, Helen, you can talk about your status quo. Yeah. <laughs> so similar like actually everybody on stage, uh, my background is in design and engineering. I'm not a scientist to actually get into biotechnology. Um, so I, I designed with like living materials, I did that at university and then in research institutes, but then decided that I actually um, want to make my ideas a reality. Uh, and when I left the comfort of the institutions, I realized that there, there's no infrastructure where you can actually do what I used to do. So um, I'm having now a, a, a place called Open Cell. So we have 70 shipping containers and we transformed it into bio laboratories that are there for people to test out their ideas and build their bio designs uh, in reality. And I chose this picture. It is, who doesn't know that, from a 2001 Space Odyssey. Yes. And it's the arrival of the monolith. Um, and why I chose it, it's because when this monolith arrived, there was, it triggered kind of a a change of, of thinking, uh, a change in evolution, and it kind of gave the, it caused this ability to kind of work with new tools, but also new weapons. And for me, that is a pretty good representation where we're at at the moment with biotechnology. Um, so to kind of give you a little bit context, it's, um, I'm not only like interested in working kind of with biomaterials, but also really working on a molecular level um, with uh, biotechnology. So what happened in the last few years is that really the costs of DNA dropped. Um, we have the computational power to actually work with biology. It's something incredible complex that we can't just convey on a piece of paper. Um, and we also kind of are at a stage where the hardware is at a stage that we can work on a such a nanoscale. Um, 
And uh, I think the that really that kind of moment that it all of that comes together is allows us actually to look at biotechnology not only for like pills and needles like medicines, but also that it slowly enters into like consumer products and that more people can take part in it. I guess where we are at the moment that it is kind of a little bit this untouchable monolith, uh, you know, kind of uh, society wise, I guess there's a lot of excitement there, but there's also a lot of fear there, what it really is. Um, and I guess I leave it for that um, and talk for it in the next picture. Very good. So my next image is this image that is very pixelated, but actually it's, um, it's something that at the MA Biodesign and in my practice we, we think a lot, which is about waste. And this is an image in the Maldives, which is where we are working now in the course. So we partnered with an NGO in, in the Maldives and the Maldives, we all know, is this amazing paradise that is facing a lot of environmental challenges. And one of the challenges they have is like they have this rubbish island where all the rubbish uh, is dumped from the island. And it's basically uh, a place, and then they export the rubbish to other countries like India, Madagascar. So this is one of the things that we are trying to think when we think about waste, when we think about the static inert material that is just dumped and how we can actually think about waste in different ways. Um, so this is like the status quo and it's something that we also very interested in is challenging because people are very familiar, there is this trivialization of waste. So people see waste everywhere and everyone thinks it's a big, huge problem. We have to do something about it. It's suffocating all the, our ecosystems. But how do we see waste as a material is something that we are very interested in. And, and uh, yeah, and discussing what is biomaterials. And we were just having this conversation. What does it mean, a biomaterial? Maybe we can delve into that in the conversation. Mm -hmm. But essentially, the biomaterial is any substance that interacts with biological systems. So maybe we can go in, I don't know, maybe we can talk about that in the next stage. So this was kind of interesting perspectives on status quo situations. Maybe now we can go into the future and each one of us can present a perspective. If you remember the images that Natsai presented, so this is her second image. Um, so, this image that you're looking at is a silk textile that has been dyed with bacteria. Um, and if you remember the first image we have, where we have the organism producing the molecule, um, and, and the thesis there is that you, you separate everything else that you have a pigment compound that you can plug into an existing um, manufacturing system, um, that approach will not yield this finish. Um, and this is something that I realized a year into the research that I was thinking about um, what we now talk about as the drop-in replacement, which is let's replace petrochemical A with bio-derived chemical B. Um, and, and that turned out to be not the most um, interesting approach to take for the work. What I started to do um, a year later was quite serendipitously to culture the microbe directly onto the textile. And that completely changed the practice because um, suddenly I realized that um, all of the mordants, all of the chemicals that I was trying to use to fix this pigment mo molecule onto the textile, uh, we no longer needed them. This is a completely color fast system without a single chemical apart from the natural inputs that you feed the microbe to be able to um, generate the, the pigment. So that was the first like, whoa, this is, this is interesting, this is big. Um, and then the second was the reduction uh, in water use that we were then exposed to uh, using this system. So typically we're using at least 500 times less water um, in any given fermentation process to dye the textile um, in this way. Uh, but as, as a designer, I was also really like um, struck by the consequences from an aesthetic point of view, the consequences from a practice point of view of suddenly realizing that my role um, wasn't necessarily to cultivate microbes so that they produce pigment molecules. Um, my role was to 
develop a new system of dye techniques that would enable us to elaborate on this um, vocabulary, this aesthetic vocabulary. So we've spent the last 10 years developing, um, you know, sometimes quite narrative-driven um, textures and colors and finishes because my, my side job at the time actually was in retail, and I was surrounded by all of these incredible um, uh, uh, designers and brands and really asking myself the question, how does the work that I'm doing in the lab interact with these market realities? The fact that you have a brand like Celine next to a brand like Dolce & Gabbana, they're going to have different requirements if we're talking about this becoming um, a system that people can integrate uh, to, to communicate their brand values. And so I present this as the, the alternative of way of seeing, not only because um, of what it yields in, in terms of um, uh, the potential for this to be a, a, a way more sustainable way of uh, production, but because it really engages us to think about how we do design differently, how we think about design in a different way, um, as it starts to interface with uh, what can become quite a te technical realm. Good. <clears throat> Eric. That's ours. <laughs> yeah, this was the crowning pavilion for the ones who went to the Dutch Design Week. Uh, they might have seen it. It's a pavilion and it's crown. Um, and I think it's very important because I hear a lot of things like in the introduction from we have to use less, <laughs> we have to use, make, produce less waste. <laughs> And it's a full, it's a complete misconception. It's just um, that we deal wrong with our environment and our materials. You cannot, it doesn't make sense to recycle these toxic plastics because you just want to get rid of it. It doesn't make any sense. Recycling is useless. We have to find new circles, mm -hmm. new circles of production. And this building, that's truly, fully circular. And it's made all on spot. And it starts with a technology which started in a laboratory, just in a Petri dish by cloning a mushroom, which is normally used for consumption. Now we clone a wood substrate mushroom, which is wood-like, like these, um, these mushrooms you find in the forest. It's much sturdier, much harder. Mm -hmm. And when you, once you clone it, you can um, have it like eat vegetative matter. In this case, we use uh, cattail, cattail in the Dutch name is uh, Lisdodde. It's a wet, uh, it's, it's a plant who lives in like a, in wetlands, um, and hemp. And hemp is grown in the Netherlands as well, in Groningen in this case. And these loose particles, the waste fibers, we clue together with these microorganisms. So it's it's something that can be done in a laboratory. We partnered with the biggest mushroom growers of Europe, uh, which are fortunately in the Netherlands, and therefore we could scale this up on a, on a bigger level and have the ability to grow these materials. You don't need land. You can do it. It's all used. Uh, it all happens indoor. It's vertical agriculture, as that's, uh, that's called. And that's the same for the, the algae. So we're making, from the algae, we're making these biopolymers that can replace traditional plastics. So what we do, we grow seaweed in the sea. We partner with, uh, with uh, sea agriculture, uh, farmers who are active in the sea instead of on land, the new farming. Then that's brought to our pilot factory in the north of Holland. Mm -hmm. uh, there, these cells are split. So we... Um, uh, through fermentation, it's a refinery process. We split the cells and then we have three streams. It's the fiber, the juice, and a waste stream, which is drinking water. The fibers we convert into biopolymers. The juice is used on land. In the Netherlands, we have a big crisis on nitrogens. It's uh, called the stickstoff crisis. And um, there's also a CO2 crisis. There's a land dropping crisis in the Netherlands. Uh, because our land drops quicker than the sea level is rising, five times faster. So we have other problems uh, which we have to overcome and to solve. And these problems, this way of producing, solves both the nitrogen crisis, the CO2 crisis, the pesticide crisis, the plastic soup crisis, and it produces in the end only drinking water and a biopolymer that you can just drop in the sea because it's marine compostable. And that changes the paradigm. It changes. <coughs> 
our fuel on consumption, and suddenly we have to make more because we have to bind more CO2 because it's so urgent that we change this kind of way how we produce daily. Uh, and this, this shows it, that we can make buildings. Uh, that's also with our seaweed biopolymers. It's already used in a building uh, as insulation uh, in Amsterdam, in the school. So therefore you see that you know, these, uh, these technologies can, can change our environment and our close environment. Very yeah? good. Thank you. <coughs> so, um, Eric talked a little bit about like the global challenges that really lie ahead at the moment, and I think you know they can only be solved, in my opinion, by like a collaboration of like minds and disciplines and vocations. Um, and I think my solution would be really what we need is is a test bed where different industries and research can come together and really can test that how these kind of futures of those living systems and materials could actually look like. Because at the moment, the reality is like you do need a laboratory to actually produce what NASA is doing and what Eric is doing. Uh, and you either have to build it yourself from scratch or you have to knock on people's door and ask if they kindly let you in and actually work with it. But means that only would work really on a small scale. And I think for impact, we really need like a lot of people joining uh, and testing it out. And I think the next step is also to just encourage a little bit of risk taking and exploration. I think it's not to kind of quickly go in a direction and just like have a solution. It's more like exploring how different solutions could really look like. Because it's not just about like creating a new material, it's more about like looking at the whole system and the circle in which that material is embedded. It. And I think Nancy, you might talk a little bit more about waste and how that actually is a great resource for all of that. So yeah, for me, the lemon and stand kind of like stands a little bit for it. I'm quite excited and I think we should encourage kind of like the sticky tape and blue tech version of your kind of like new made up kind of biomaterial business and see also on one side how would you really create it and you know how can you really get a master of your craft but then on the other side is also like how do people re actually react to it how we have we do we have to build a new aesthetic around it new machineries around it new markets around it so yeah i'm quite excited about like the new lemonade stands that hopefully pop up very soon very nice yep. so this is the last image it kind of really ties very well with what you all said but with the, I think the image is intended to encapsulate this idea of growth, growing things, growing materials that you, know, you can really have to start shifting from a manufacturing industry that uses a lot of energy to produce you know, molds, to produce, you, know, you need heat, basically. You need heat to produce materials and construct, constructing, you don't. <laughs> so how do you build plastics and MDF? And, or, or, um, yeah. Now, if you grow mushrooms, they produce heat. Exactly. That's why I'm having the, the mycelium as yeah. the alternative, yeah. as, the, as a binder of material. Yeah, exactly, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this <laughs> is like the shift from having energy into something that you don't need energy to grow, aggregate, substrate, which is what Eric does a lot, and we do a lot in my practice too. We do a lot. So with waste, you can have waste as a, as a substrate, and mycelium digests the waste and binds the waste, and it creates this natural glue. So basically, shifting from a, um, an industry that transforms fossil fuel-based uh, resources, and it requires a lot of energy to transform it and process it, into an industry that takes biological systems and, and grows products and materials. Of course, uh, yeah. a, a very romantic kind of you know, idea that we would grow everything. So, of course, this is romantic, but it is possible at a certain scale. And that, I think that leads into the, very, to the topic of scale nicely, I would say, transitions into this idea that is very, very important, is that uh, people come to biodesigners. First of all, biodesign is something that people don't really understand very well what it is. It's, a very emergent, it's a, an emergent movement. So us at Central St. Martins have, creating this course, we we encountered a lot of misunderstanding, perhaps, and expe expectations of what biodesign is. But one of the first questions we get is always how, OK, very nice prototypes, how do you scale them up? So people come to industry partners, come to Central St. Martins, and they come to Natsai, come to Helen, probably come to you many times, many more times than to me. But 
But that's an, I think that's an important question we can maybe discuss. I mean, what is the scale? What is your scale? How big do you want to go? Mm -hmm. I mean, because I think scale, you know, it's very open. I mean, yeah. how many units do you need to produce to make this product, you know, believable and serious? And is it a niche proje project or you want to go to IKEA scale? So maybe I would start with that. There's issues of scale, there's issues of data, there's issues of infrastructure, issues of timing, because timing is different by growing and just, you know, making molds. So I would I just leave it to you. How do you want to, to start this conversation? And then we have the audience also. We have time, 25 minutes now, to share some insights between us. Great. Thanks think? a lot. Yeah. I'm happy to start. Yeah, this great. <laughs> I guess it's always like the, the first question, the biggest issue, and probably for everybody in the room, um, you know, when you think about scale, it has to be applicable to a full building or like uh, multiple chairs and like on, on something industrial. Uh, in my opinion, I really don't care at this stage. Um, I, for me, it's like a discussion that, yes, it's interesting for the future, but I think the scale that I'm interested in at the moment is the people that join us, like, can you make something and go either to a customer, to somebody to actually communicate what it is what you're doing. Can you go through the whole supply chain and look in how it actually would get produced? And then for me, that is the starting point. Show me that you can make five. Can you show me that you can make 10? And then, you know, kind of like, it's also like a much more natural way. And in one way you can improve the whole supply chain step by step rather than kind of going to the 10,000 leaders uh, and just ignore all the issues on the way. Um, so for me, the small scale, the local production is for me at the moment exactly the right scale that we should have in the field. Yeah, nice. I, I think what's really um, inspiring about biology is when people say, can this scale? Um, I always say, well, actually, nature, if you think of it as a technology, is the most scalable technology in the world because you find nature everywhere. We have an Amazon forest because nature scales. The question is, how do we actually um, take those principles and think about how they are interacting with our, uh, with our communities, with our societies? Um, <clears throat> and, and that's when it becomes interesting, because we've also been brewing beer for thousands of years, so actually we know how to do this. Um, the, the, what is coming out the other end is perhaps um, the, the, the point of difference. So can we scale these industries? Absolutely, we can, um, but it requires a, a mindset shift as to where we are right now. And I think that where we are right now, I would say that um, particularly consumer-facing biotechnology uh, is very much in, in its nascent um, period. Uh, we have been org uh, engineering organisms uh, to create our pharmaceuticals again for decades. Uh, so we, in terms of th those kinds of infrastructures, they already exist. Um, what we need to decide as a society is whether or not how we thought about scale in the context of petroleum-based um, industrial revolutions is compatible with the scales of a uh, biological ent entity or, uh, that is the Earth that has planetary boundaries. Um, that's how we need to start thinking about scale. So I, I really agree with um, Helene about what it means to empower people to work with living systems um, at a... At a at a more manageable scale that is in, in, in dialogue, if you like, with those supply chains of what are the inputs that are coming into this fermentation process? How are we processing waste? What are those symbiotic industries even that start to build a, not just a circular material, but a circular system of production? Um, when we are looking at scale, uh, as relates to industry, uh, we are very fascinated actually by um, mass industrial scale because I think we can learn what those boundaries, what those actual limitations are. And so we are working with um, uh, effectively brands who, who are, are saying to us, how do we get this from the pilot to 10,000 units um, to start? Uh, and that is a very fascinating um, sort of endeavor. Um, but at the same time, that cuts out a lot of the capabilities that we've been building up because some of them are not scalable in that way. And so we have to be comfortable, I think, with the idea that um, we, what nature is providing us are lots of different options to think about scale. 
I also believe that, yes, um, you know, being able to um, curtail the chemical damage that is being done in our waterways through industrial production can only happen if the biggest brands are changing their production processes. So it's a constant tension, I think, for us, because on one hand, we recognize uh, the fact that the molecule, the drop-in replacement is, is, is absolutely needed. Um, but at the same time, I guess our practice is um, a, more sort of wedded towards um, that space for other possibilities that thinking otherwise can open up. What do you think, yeah. Eric? Yeah, so I think you said several interesting things. Uh, first of all, you know, like, what is biodesign? Yes. Um, I saw that, like, this field became so broad. There are many disciplines within. Um, and it's also about time that we start making, you know, different disciplines. Uh, our perspective is more applied science um, from a design background. Um, we also are active in education on the Design Academy. We started a bio lab a couple of years ago, which is now actively uh, running. So there it, it's really about, you know, educating, bringing, you know, uh, introducing new technologies, working with microorganisms, um, growing your own materials, uh, that's very important. On another level, you know, like for instance with the mycelium chair, which uh, we were the first 3D printing living mycelium cells into 3D forms. Um, you know, that had a lot of reach globally, mm -hmm. and that empowered a lot of people to start growing mycelium and trying to make it their own. Um, so that was very important for storytelling, yep. um, awareness. So I think that's also very important. But what we are now, you know, since like five to ten years are active uh, on is more context related. So we really try to make, create new networks and not only work in a laboratory, let's say if, as a comparison if you want to make acar out of uh, red seaweed, it involves chemicals. Uh, we have a procedure which doesn't involve any chemicals, so something which you could show in the lab, which most people consider as plant-based, as a you know, natural uh, alternative to fossil. Um, doesn't have to be the solution in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, we had to completely redesign the whole the whole process of how to come from an uh, aquatic organism towards a biopolymer, um, and that's now uh, that line from seaweed to biopolymer, and simultaneously having all the fertilizers for land, the natural and the drinking water. Uh, that's something we can put in a box. Um, and we can exploit, and that's also our plan. So we want to, to bring, that, bring that out. We're talking to a partner in Ireland who wants to have this production facility, so we can uh, apply it there. But it's also something we would like to, to test out in the middle of the desert, you know? Imagine that you grow aquatic uh, salt organisms on the shore. Uh, secondly, you fertilize land, you have drinking water, and you will create, you know, trees, plants, uh, or agriculture. So it enables it, you know, on only maybe a little bit of solar energy. Um, so I think it's very important to, to think about the whole structure, mm -hmm. and therefore that's why we work with farmers, engineers, um, even cheese makers who build cheese factories. Uh, you know, like all these, these uh, people who are in disciplines which we formally didn't work with, uh, in order to, to understand how to scale up these, these processes and bring them into uh, to reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very interesting because I, will, I would expect you being, you're a product designer. Sorry? You, you are a product designer. Are you a product I, I'm, designer? Yeah, product, but that's not the yeah. good word because we were more on, on material, color. <laughs> uh, so that's a background. And together with my partner, who is more context, uh, context of really a public space designer, it's really about these two, you know, intertwining. Systems, yeah. Yeah, Designing yeah. systems. Social design now it's called, mostly. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Nancy? Yeah. Yes. I think, you know, like education is a quite interesting one because from somewhere, you know, the knowledge has to come somewhere, no? Uh, and most disciplines do have a pathway for education. And I, I, I guess, like, um, it's the MA Biodesign is something, you know, quite new with a quite different approach. So I was hoping maybe you can yeah. share a little bit about that because it's, it's, it's a quite interdisciplinary course in itself. Yes, so that's the most exciting thing that we are 
I mean, that we, at Centro San Martins, we think about it, like, that's what keeps us going, keeps us there, is that, that there are no pedagogies that integrate science and design. So we are creating everything from scratch, and many times we, we don't know how, <laughs> basically. So how are we gonna do this? And that's really exciting. So we have a team of, it's basically one designer and two scientists. So we have a lab, mm -hmm. and we are, Really, and, it, and it's a course for designers. We, it's not for scientists. It's for designers that want to integrate science in their design process, so in this collaboration with living systems. So it's very much about designing with living systems as a design tool. That's what we are, I mean, we all say. Like, we are using living systems as a, as a tool, as you use, you know, digital fabrication, computational design, you're using a living system as well in collaboration. Uh, so it's difficult to, to teach students with no science background, so you have to teach them, you know, notions of biology, chemistry, but you have to teach them a different language, you know, and that's really key for us. How do you start introducing kind of a, we are inventing, we like to say we are inventing a biodesign language. So, we, you know, we, you keep a glossary of these things, you start thinking about what is an enzyme, how does the pigment metabolize it, how does the molecule, molecule metabolize the pigment, things like that, and that's what we like the most, you know, this collaboration. So the scientists, uh, so I am learning science and designers are learning the design language so, and then we are creating something uh, that other people are doing. Not, it's not just Centro St. Martins, other people are doing in other schools, but it's mostly about that, how do we, you how do you teach students that they have to really uh, learn things in a very quantifiable way? They have to be super precise in terms of experimentation. So they have to analyze failure and, and, and success. So what's the sale? So how do you quantify, for example, mycelium growth? You do image analysis, you do microscopic analysis, you really understand all the variables that you know, mycelium has, temperature, environment, additives, nutrients, etc., etc., and then how you iterate with substrates, so there's many variables, different substrates, different strains of mushrooms, different environmental con uh, conditions. So, uh, uh, sanitized conditions can really widely vary, you know, the results. So it's about having this more of scientific methodology in design, being very rigorous, and um, yeah, I'm going on and on and on about it. But, but, but in, in relation to scale, I wanted to go back to that, I have no answers to that. I think, I think it depends on whoever the brand is or whoever the entrepreneur wants to do with it. Uh, I think you have to create your own tools. I don't need necessarily that oh, people saying, oh, so now you have to, all entrepreneurs, all brands need to have their own wet lab. It's not necessarily about that, but it's mostly deeply about interdisciplinarity. Uh, I don't want to be a scientist. I will never be a scientist. And scientists will never be a designer. I think that's about collaboration. And that's about learning how to talk with each other, because it's very easy to do, you know, science, they are doing their science, I'm doing my design, it's very comfortable, I don't have to interact with them. But, and it's very difficult to interact, because we are all very different people, and we think in very different ways, and it's very complicated. So it's about understanding that we are in this environment at Central St. Martins, where you have to work together every day, you know, and you work every day. Like, you have to really communicate and, and try to come up with this common language. So that's what I think is the future, really, is interdisciplinarity. Because interdisciplinarity has been going on for many, many years. Everybody thinks they are interdisciplinary. I mean, there's a lot of interdisciplinarity. But, you know, at a very deep level, at a daily level, it's really difficult to find infrastructure in, in, in companies, in schools. I mean, I've, been, I've always worked in... I've, I've been teaching architecture for 15 years, and I started doing biomaterials on my own with my students. And I got into a lot of trouble in my university with health and safety. I was always constantly being kicked out of labs, of spaces, because I was doing health and safety. I mean, I was breaking all the rules of health and safety. I got in trouble. I got fines. I got, like, slapped in the wrist, left, right, and center. I, I also, I, and then I, I collaborated with scientists, but they also didn't want me there. So I was being kicked out and doing kind of guerrilla biomaterials everywhere. And it was very frustrating, you know. It was very frustrating to convince architecture schools the, the need of a, of a wet lab, as you need digital fabrication. So, scaling up, for me, is not about producing many, many, many units. It's, it's about producing a different way of, 
of designing. I'm not interested in designing to, like people designed 20 years ago. As a designer, my ethos is not going there. I'm not interested at, on, at, at all. So I'm interested in creating something new. And I think this new generation is interested in that, being part of this, this movement. But yeah, how am I going to make money out of it? It's hard. It is very hard, you know. I, th I think that the education piece is, goes beyond educating, um, you know, future graduates. It's actually how do we educate industry? Um, and, and when I say that, I don't mean how do we tell industry what to do. I mean, how do we co-develop with industry? How do we learn together? Mm. Um, one of the challenges I think that we've faced um, is m much of the work that we do has been really well received by the fashion industry because that's where it can potentially have the biggest impact. Um, but fashion doesn't think long term. Fashion's business model is based on finding the cheapest place to produce. What was very interesting for me when we started to interface with um, industries that are more uh, R&D driven, like the automotive industry, is that you can have a conversation about what do we want to produce uh, together in the next five years. And this is the fundamental kind of shift, I think, that we need to start making from an, from an industry point of view, is, is knowing that you know, people like us are not just suppliers um, because it's too early. Um, but what we have the poten potential to do right now is to be co-developers. And, and the reason why this is so critical is because otherwise scientists, the, te the technical realm of this field, is going to be producing solutions that have no context. And that context comes from culture. That context comes from brands who understand their supply chain and the ramifications of that pigment molecule in their supply chain. So it's kind of impossible for us to think of, um, you know, there's applied science here, there's research there, the designers are going to come in and communicate the thing later on. This is a completely integrated um, uh, practice, and I think that's how we actually achieve reasonable scales because we're, we're doing that based on what the reality of those conditions, um, those conditions actually are. So maybe we can open the debate. I don't know if there are any, I mean, in terms of infrastructure, of course, we need different kinds of infrastructure. We need labs, we need maybe, you know, I would love to hire a scientist if I had a, you know, money for my studio, my colleges. So it's about this, about this. The teams are different, infrastructure is different, but also timing is different. Many people think, oh, you know, mycelium takes so long to grow. But yeah, I mean, it takes a long time to get the marble from, you know, Italy and extract it and then, you know, transport the marble, you know, all these things. I mean, all these processes incredibly energy consuming and incredibly damaging to the environment. I mean, that's, I mean, if you start thinking about that, mycelium is actually really fast. Mm -hmm. It is. You know, so. And also in, comparable to, in comparison to traditional techniques, there are many techniques which take super long. And then, yeah, don't think about like that fossil oil take millions of years in order to yes. be processed. But I mean more also daily, daily goods, even also biomaterials which we all have around. So our studio is now in Sandom, which is uh, like known for, the, for their windmills, eh, that it was a kind of bio-based economy. From that derived uh, the linoleum, you know, the floors which you'll see everywhere, which is also a fermentation process and it takes also weeks. And growing mycelium takes four days. So what's the problem? It's more um, that you need a little bit of space. But that's all, it's all manageable, yeah. I, I don't see that problem at all. Maybe we have yeah. questions? But it's a good one, yeah. 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 <coughs> do, you, do you want to make, yeah? wait for the mic? I think. Mics. Oh, thank you very much. So yeah. far it's been very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I had one question. Um, since you guys mostly have design backgrounds and that sort of uh, perspective, um, and I come mostly from a science background. And you did say that um, as a designer, you can't be a scientist, and a scientist can't be a designer. Um, I was just wondering, what does design add to science thought and, yeah, tra train of thought and systems? And how does science add to 
your perspective and tr train of thought. I just want to see, you're talking about integration, but I can't exactly see how you're seeing this, if that makes sense. I mean, from speaking with my colleagues, the scientists, I mean, first of all, they are not normal scientists because they abandon real research in real labs to come to, you know, an art and design school. So that's a very brave step for them, to step away from real science, you know, to, you know, this chaotic environment, which is an art and design school. Uh, they think, well, they were a bit disillusioned with science, you know. I think that we are a bunch of, like, disillusioned people. I was disillusioned with, you know, traditional ways of designing. They were disillusioned with traditional ways of making science. Science is a very different, difficult world. Even you start looking, you know, into the serious science application grants, you know, it's, it's a very tyrannic kind of um, system. And also architecture is a very, very cruel and very complicated world. So. They like the speed of design. That's what they say the most. You know, in design, things ha happen really fast. We spend 10 years doing this experiment with this microbe, and nothing really happens. And, you know, I don't want to spend my life doing that. I mean, so that's the main appeal. They think it's super exciting, the fact that design is so fast, it's real, it's tangible, it's physical. You see it happen, and it's very experimental. Science is very serious. People, they don't. Like to take, they like to say no to crazy ideas all the time. Like, that's what they like to say. Like, no, that's not possible. You don't know what you're talking about. You're a, sci you're a designer, you don't, know what, you don't know anything about what you're saying. Like, so they are, so, you know. And I think what science gives to design, it gives it, like, uh, you know, designers are very good at dreaming and vision, envisioning ideas and, and, and communicating ideas, visualizing things making beautiful drawings. So scientists make it real, I think. The science makes it real. It's not speculative anymore. It's actually possible, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I, I guess I see like a lot, like, I like this kind of imagining, that like the designers are very open from the beginning, so there's no predefined yeah. path. And that's like the, the opposite most, yeah, yeah, generally. Let's speak yes, of generals, course. very sorry about it. <laughs> but you know, that there's no predefined path. And uh, they can take different directions along the way, so sometimes the, the project completely changes along the, the findings along the way, but for science, it gives a lot of new insights, a lot of new oh. directions, and it, it's these kind of starting points that's from, wow, you know, like... It's so interesting, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess for I see yeah. the relationship. I mean, the definition of science is that you prove your hypothesis, you're looking for new findings. It's not that you kind of like repeat findings, it's, the f it's fundamental making new findings. What the design side does, putting that, those new findings into different contexts and see how they can be applied. And I think that's the beauty of the relationship. And design, design, I mean, so I went into a science lab as a designer um, and I was just asked very politely not to break anything. <laughs> um, but because you have a different knowledge system and you aren't limited by scientific method, at least to begin with, um, how you approach things is, I'm just going to try it. Um, how can I possibly know, if I haven't tried it, whether or not it's going to work? And countless times, scientists always say, gosh, I just, I just would have been like, that's just the wrong way to go about it. <laughs> um, I remember when I first cultured the bacteria onto the textile, and, and John was like, uh, John is my collaborator, Professor John Ward at University College London, and, and, he, and he was like, I guess in terms of health and safety, this is okay, but actually, you know, that capacity to, to not be held by a certain framework helps experimentation go in a fundamentally different uh, direction. And conversely, um, by the time you have a system that you think works, then you have to get deep into the science. So our practice is oscillating between these two spaces where we're saying, where is the creative impetus for what we're doing alongside um, the microbes broken? <laughs> um, how, 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 do we, how do we push this to, to the next stage? And actually, by the time you're talking about scale, that's really a technical pursuit in many regards. So the science really lives there. So when you look at um, my, my, my idea of the future biotech startup that's doing this kind of work, um, you, know, you, you need chief um, uh, technology officers working alongside uh, designers, working alongside technologists. Uh, it, it, it's, it's so integral that people work together. Thank you very much. 
we have any more questions? Yes. Hey. Thank you so much. Very interesting indeed. I have um, a question. Um, we had been um, hearing a lot about transdisciplinarity and saying that this is really the future, and this is also what I believe. But my question is more, uh, do you see like me that it seems to take so much time uh, for people and mentality on a global level, for people to arrive to um, understand that this is the future, and why do you think it's taking so much time? Why does change take time? <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, gosh. Um, yes, that this is really, um, it's taking time because I think we have a very complicated system and it's very difficult to know where to intervene on that system to make that, you know, a, a scalable change, right? Um, one of the things that we've realized we need to do as a design practice is um, interact in different ways with industries that creates the space um, to create that dialogue for what it means for interdisciplinarity. So we spent um, five months in a biotech startup uh, working in their lab to prove that it is really valuable to have designers in residence in your lab. And now that interaction turned into a, a, a residency program that's called the Ginkgo Creative Residency. Open call is open now. Um, and what we do is we invite creatives with, to answer the design brief and live in Boston, that's where the lab is, um, for three months developing that project. And it, and it achieves two things. A designer can come into this, you know, the, future, the lab of the future and consider their practice in that technological context, um, but also, and, and they can produce prototypes that resonate beyond um, the traditional sphere of design. What it does for the company at an organizational level is for the first time, those scientists are walking past the lab and they can see the crazy designer taking things out of the incubator and it's real, it's tangible, and they can have conversations. And the CEO comes down to see what's going on. And so you, you can start to create a, a, a better understanding of the value of design in this space like that if you create room for it to live. And in, in a way, that's I think what Helen is doing at scale is actually how do we convene all of these people um, in a site and literally make a landmark that nobody can ignore um, in, in a city like London. So mm -hmm. we're going to need to take on lots of different strategies, I think, mm -hmm. to um, catalyze action. Like, it's so boring having the same conversation <laughs> all the time. Like, I'm bored, people. Let's do something. <laughs> you know, we really need to, to just get on with getting on with it. Um, it's, it's possible, there are precedents, we can learn from each other. Let's just let's stop talking here and start doing it. I really think it's about infrastructure and what Ellen is doing. Why, why is it so complicated to create spaces like, you, what, like you're doing? Why there's so few of them? I don't think it's complicated at all. Um, I think it just, it is a relatively new field. So like, you know, it, it just used to happen in science universities uh, and then in me medical companies. Um, so I think there was also not particular maybe the, the need for that just like 10 years ago. Um, and, and now it's like, I mean, it's a little bit like, like the kitchen really. It's like a fancy kitchen. Um, and it needs a little bit of a refreshment to be honest. Um, I think, you know, like where it needs work is like the machines just, just uh, very expensive. Nobody has kind of overlooked them. So you have to give you an example, machines can cost between 50 to 200,000 pounds just for one single machine. What is not really needed, you know, from the open source factor, um, I think there's kind of a lack of it. Um, I think there's a lot of like computational solutions we can do there. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's like complicated. I think it's a great opportunity and actually yeah. having all these people kind of like joining and working with us, they actually will define how that infrastructure will look like. Um, so I think that's really the exciting bit as well. Because um, I really think spaces, spaces like yours will radically change the way entrepreneurs are working, how products are going to be made, because they have, you know, these spaces where they have a lab, they have, you know, scientists working there. And I think 
that's the main problem with young entrepreneurs is that I don't have a lab. I mean, where am I going to do this? That, so. And then also like the next step, I think what is quite exciting, right? Like it's, it's again a little bit like the test bed of like, as an entrepreneur, or like as a startup, you have no idea what you're actually doing. You kind of like learn it on the go and you evolve with it. And I think it's quite exciting to see that also reflected in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And what we see now happening if they actually kind of like grow out of our spaces with the first company now, who kind of took on an old factory in, so in, in the UK you have like a lot of um, factories that um, are just inactive anymore at the seaside. The economy is kind of shit there, to be honest. So the, the towns there struggle a little bit. And they took on one of those factories and now have a first case study how actually a mycelium factory for insulation material could look like. And it means also it won't be actually just kind of like the academics and designers, they won't be the one who actually will stand in the factory. So there's also when in terms of infrastructure, how do you build now new pathways to jobs, right? So you can yeah, start and look and building the first apprenticeship scheme. And I think that's where it gets really exciting, where you're kind of like seeing how kind of like the sticky tape blue tech version kind of like evolves uh, and then takes different shapes around the UK. Mm. Yeah. I, think it's, I yeah. think it's time. Any more questions? Do we have time for one more or is it like... <laughs> yeah. We have six. <laughs> is there a last question? <laughs> I think so. Okay. Thank you. Well, well thank, thank you very much. I, I think very much the, the, the panel members was very, very inspirational. We like to think that biodesign is the future here, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, Helen, Natsai, Eric. Thank you very much. I'm, I, I need to spoil this discussion. I have the feeling you could continue for a long time. But thank you very much. Very insightful.